Good evening, everyone. At the outset, deep gratitude to Jayapur Literary Festival, the Teamworks Arts, particularly Sanjay Roy, Namita, uh, William, and others for giving me the honor and the opportunity to be in conversation with two great novelists. I know other way. I know no other way of describing them, who have, in a manner of speaking, have redefined Indian fiction in English and in translation. Uh, both Raj Kavanjha and Vivek Shanbag need no introduction. They are well known and acclaimed novelists, journalists, and acclaimed engineers also, and that we will see how and why. Uh, they have shifted from that very promising career to being journalists and writers. Uh, before I get into conversation with my esteemed uh, panelists, I want to contextualize this session in two ways. Both the works that we discuss this evening have been published in 2023 by Penguin Random House. Of course, Vivek's Sakina's Kiss came out earlier, but the 2021, but the translation came out in 2023, am I right? Yes. And uh, Raja's uh, latest novel, The Patient in Bed Number 20, came out in 2023. In fact, here are the copies of the books that we are interrogating. This is Raja's book, and we have then. Here is Sakina's kiss. <laughs> and uh, you would have the opportunity to have your copies signed after the session. Both our authors will be more than happy and willing to sign the copies, which are uh, as a defining text as far as Indian fiction is concerned. Contextualizing these two texts in the arena of fiction. I am reminding of two particular uh, happenings or occurrences, I would say. Nearly, nearly 100 years ago, one, the publication of major texts in the early 2020s, early 1920s, Ulysses and the Wasteland, in 1922, both. And in the context of India, Another novelist who is one of my favorite and who, in my view, defined what it means, what, what the novel form means in Hindi literature is Prem Chand, whose seminal work, Rang Bhumi, was published in 1924. The reason why I'm mentioning these three texts is that just as the three texts in reference responded to the changing times, both in Europe and in India, post First World War, and in the context of nationalist movement. In my view, both Sakina's case and the patient in bed number 12 also respond to the changing times in India, not just post pandemic, to which there's an overt reference in Raj's work, but also in the context of globalization, the opening of a new economy, the division of society. That's why the session is called fiction, faction, and the spaces in between. The, all the terms may have a very, these are very noted terms and may have very different meanings for different people. Are we going into senos or divisions? What does the word faction indicate? What is the space in between which the novelist is trying to fill? are some of the issues which the session hopes to interrogate. And I would begin by asking both the parents, our esteemed authors, as to what motivated them to write these works and what was going on in their minds, what was the process of writing, any important moments, any thoughts they would like to share before we ask them to read out from their works because the taste of the pudding is in the eating. So before we got into any discussion, we would have readings from both the novelists. Um, Vivek's text, of course, is, has been translated by 
Shrinath Prairur, who has a wonderful translator. I have read both his translated works, Khachar Ghochar, which was published in 2013, translated in 2015, and Sakina's case published in 2021, 2023. I must say, not just that, John Fowler, in fact, said in 1999, after Raj's first book, The Blue Bed Spread, came that an Indian novel has come into age. I would say we will make translation of Sakina's case, Sakina Ramuttu, by Rashi Nath Parur, the Indian novel in translation has also come of age. So it's a historic session, it's a great session, where we hope to understand how the two texts have taken a turn to us, the redefinition of Indian writing in English and in translation. Beginning with Raj then, how do you think, what was the process, the motivation, and the thoughts behind writing a text like this is a six book, Raj. Uh, how have you come, in what way have you come far or near to your first book, The Blue Pet Spread? Hi. Uh, thank you very much, Anil, for that generous introduction. Uh, and first, I'd like to say uh, thank you so much for all of you to be here. I checked my sales ranking on Amazon, and it is wonderful to see you here. Uh, um, you make us feel more special than we are. Uh, and you know, when you said, what is the motivation for the, for the book? Um, it's not new. It is something that I have, that first took me to journalism, which was the search for spaces uh, where people live without their stories being told. Uh, and I have always been drawn to such spaces which lie in the shadows where secrets live. I believe uh, that we live, we live in those spaces. We don't live in the spaces where we debate and contest ideas. We live in spaces that we do not uh, talk about, uh, that are secret, um, that are always draped in shadows. And fiction to me has been a tool to go into those spaces. And about four years ago, as each one of us in this room, in this room knows, that we were forced to live in a space uh, which we, we were not used to. Uh, we live in a society where we can swipe our card and buy things. And for the first time, we were forced to live in a space where we were lonely, yes, but we were also vulnerable in a very new kind of way, where who we are did not matter so much. It did matter. Um, you know, I'm very lucky and we, and and many of us were very lucky to live during COVID in a room where we could do our work on Zoom. And there were many people who did not have that luxury. Um, but that was a space um, which was a very special space. And uh, to me, it was a vulnerable space where I thought where most of our stories lie more so in the last eight to 10 years when we find how polarized we have become and we live in spaces where we are comfortable with those who completely agree with us. So we have left the middle space and I think that's where we live. Uh, um, you know, and this book was essentially my search for a space in this polarized world where we look for a space where people live, where it does not matter who you vote for, uh, um, and where we are all equally vulnerable. And that was where the book came from. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. No doubt the experience on 24th March 2020 was unparalleled in our lives perhaps in history, and redefined the space and the world for all of us, including about our own identity. Vivek, could you please, thank your you thoughts Anil. on that? Thank you, Anil. Thank you very much. Yeah, it is uh, 
very difficult for me to put my finger on and say this is where I got the inspiration. Not just for this book, but for any book. It's very difficult. And uh, it, is, it is not just one thing. Maybe something uh, gets triggered, but then it is, it is a, for me, the telling a story is very important. And if I say anything more in the sense that, you know, that what it means and what I was uh, trying to say, I would probably simplify it. And uh, something that was bothering me and which is, which is what uh, you might have seen in Ghachar Gochar and many of my other works is what's happening in this country in the last 30 years. I feel that change is very significant, the globalization and, and the open market. And that, is, that has impacted our lives. And we think we understand it. We pretend we understand it. But I don't think we understand it. And that something is what is what I try to capture in uh, Sakina's case. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I will not keep you away from the pudding. I think it's important that we hear from the authors, read about their work, extracts from their work, read out some portion, so we know the kind of genius that the books contain. Raj, would you like to go first? So I'll just give some basic context, because I will read a very, very short passage. I don't want to read. I don't like to read. When I write a book, I want everybody else to read it, not me. Uh, but uh, we need to read here. Uh, so this is the patient uh, in the book. And uh, he's waiting for his daughter to come and meet him. And he is in his last stage. And the nurse tells him that, look, uh, you are not going to live. But you need to wait for your daughter to come and see you. So why don't we do something? I don't know how many days you have. But uh, just as we take a bit of a virus to make a vaccine to fight the virus, uh, we need a bit of life to fight death. So what you need to do is every day, you need to find a bit of life to fight the death. And, we, and you need to do it f for a few days until your daughter comes. And, uh, and so this is what he does. I'm very lucky, he says. I'm very lucky I am so light that with little, that with very little, with, with very little work, I can rise above the bed. So I float and I'm carried by the currents of the room's cooled, disinfected air. He is in, he is in the intensive care unit. And then I can go up and down along the walls beneath the ceiling. I can slip through the cracks in the frame of the only window in the room. Those tall street lamps you see, I float past these neons wrapped in blue during the day, rain yellow at night. I will fly alongside birds. I will ride the jet stream of a passenger aircraft. The gust of a wind will push me up until I become a moving speck high above the city. The pale red dot in the first light, the dazzling blink in the falling dark. I will be in orbit in lockstep with my nation. In this year, 2023, 1.4 billion, they the people, their 1.2 billion plus phones, stack them up, you can go up to the moon. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, 800 million younger than I am, posting 1 million seconds of video each day, the good, the bad, the crazy, the demented, 
the topsy-turvy, the basket case, the lost, the found, the helter, the skelter, the hungry, the angry, the ambitious, the hopeless, the rulers, the ruled, the unruly, I will see them all, telescopic and microscopic. I am Galileo, I am Galilei, I see the unseen, I see the lives of others, but as Sister Shiny, who is the nurse in the intensive care unit, but as Sister Shiny said, I need only a fragment, just one little odd, just one little end. So I wait and I watch, and when the moment is right, when the alignment is perfect of earth and water, fire and air, space and time, the material and the immaterial that have defined us down the ages, I will descend to where they are. I will press myself against the walls of the houses where they live, so flat that I become one-dimensional. I will merge with the surface, the plaster and the paint, and when their backs are turned towards me, I creep up, shadow-like. I flit, sometimes float, my toe inches off the floor to avoid any sound. I bring my ear close to their heads so that I can listen to their thoughts, the buzz and crackle inside, their neural fires burning. Sometimes, if I'm lucky, I will find a broken heart and squeeze myself in to flow with the blood in the narrows of the vessels, unnoticed and unfelt, like I am traffic on the empty streets where we lived once upon a time in this city. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Beautiful. Beautiful. Intense imagery, packed along with stark reality, deep at the very personal level, but intensely universal. And listening to you, Raj, one could not make out whether it's prose or poetry. It was so beautiful, so well, well read, and so intense. In fact, this whole, this combination between reality, of reality and Im a symbolism, coexisting, is a hallmark of both uh, the, the text that we are interrogating this evening, that of Raj and Vivek. Vivek, would love to hear from you now. I will read from uh, Sakina's case. This was published in Canada two years ago, and the translation was uh, published last year. Uh, last year meaning a few months ago. Uh, before coming here, at lunch I met uh, Harish Trivedi, and uh, he asked me where is the session, and I said in Baitak. Then he said that's a South Indian pronunciation. And I said I will read something in response to what you said, and here it is. <laughs> My name, Venkata Ramana, so richly intoned by the teachers at my village school, lost the flick of the tongue at its end in the mouths of my North Indian friends at engineering college and became Venkat Raman. It then dwindled to Venkat among colleagues. If I had spent some time in the United States, I am sure I would have turned into a Venki. <laughs> Perhaps the transformation of my name says something about the path I have traveled and my easy acceptance of it, something about the firmness of my convictions. I had taken a picture of the family deity with me to engineering college, but it never emerged from my bag. A boy named Harish joined college the same day as me and neatly arranged pictures of gods and goddesses on his table. The students pounced on him with such glee that the nickname Bhatta, priest, stuck to him for the rest of his life. In the, in the circumstances, I thought it best to keep my God confined to my bag. After all, when you want to win a swimming race, you don't dive in carrying weights. For months, I worried that someone might accidentally see the picture in my bag and spread the word. With all this going on, I wasn't going to make a fuss about one syllable at the end of my name. I finished my engineering and got a job at a multinational. On my first day at work, a smart aleck from HR went on for two hours about company culture, reminding me every few minutes how fortunate I was to have got a job there. 
he sought my permission with a stale joke. You know, in an emergency, it might be too late by the time your full name is said. Shall I call you Venkat? This, remind me, this reminded me of the custom of changing women's names after marriage. So I joked back. I feel like I'm getting married to the job. He was too smart to get the joke. That is an amazing feeling, he said and laughed. Then he took me around the office and introduced me to everyone as Venkat. Then this goes on. Then he talks about a bit about his wife, Viji. Except in details, the story of Viji's professional life is not very different from mine. She did her MSc in mathematics and got a job in the IT industry, which welcomes degree holders of all descriptions with open arms. Since it is hard to tell apart the various organisms that swim in the vast ocean of IT, I will not tempt, attempt to describe her role. But it should come as no surprise that her work too has no relation to the mathematics she studied. As a precaution against becoming obsolete, she's, she signs up for courses every now and then to update her technical skills. And goes on further. <coughs> and later he says, <coughs> How have we continued to endure each other? If we were asked the sort of silly questions heard on TV shows that set out to find the ideal couple, his favorite color, her first school's name, we would surely do well. But cracks below the surface of a relationship are harder to see. It is surprising that even in times like these, no one has thought of testing a couple's compatibility by drawing out the details of their political views. Anyway, in our case, it would not be wrong to say that soon after we were married, a shared interest became the foundation of some sort of domestic harmony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vivek. Let me, uh, let me read uh, for a half a minute on in Canada so that you know how uh, it sounds. ऊरी न शाले या मास्टर रो बाई तुम्बा वेंकटर मना इंडो करेट द नन्हे हैसे रो इंजीनियरिंग कॉलेज ना उत्तर भारत तक गैलेरा नाली की गे सरिया आगे सिलुक दे वेंकट रामन नागी मुंदे ऑफिस ने वरा बायली वेंकट आये तो आवकाश दर तो नानी ने आदरो अमेरिक के होगी नेल सिद्ध रे वेंकी आगुते दरनुले Suchisitu dendo kelowo me nanagani suudu tappa gala rado. Thank you. Thank you. Our identities are changing. Our identities come under pressure and subsume in order in various ways, particularly in this very materialistic corporate age, and people migrate from village to city, from education to employment. So many brought out in the next trend wave of the passage we just heard. Uh, one of the things that I want to comment on is a very complicated time scale that both the novels follow, but before that, today, one thing that troubles me about your work is the title. There is no character called Sakina in uh, the book is titled Sakina's Kiss, but there's no Sakina in the novel. How do you how do you justify this? How do you uh, how do you validate this kind of title when there's no Sakina and if the title book is called Sakina's Kiss, as if she is a central character? I think there is Sakina, but you have to find her. Okay, so please tell uh, me. <laughs> I will find her. Uh, what I mean is that, uh, see, it's very difficult uh, for a writer to decide on the title. When I say decide, one has to uh, decide what role the title has to play in uh, providing that reading experience to the reader. Uh, I'm sure all of you have experienced, um, as me, that we are sometimes you know, 20 pages into the book and we can't recollect the exact title of the book. Uh, many times people tell us stories about the book, but they can't remember the title of the book. So title is very tricky, and, and at times it is, I think one also has to be lucky about the title. Uh, uh, for example, my Ghachar Ghochar, uh, the previous novel, uh, I named it, it, it's a nonsense phrase. And the suggestion was to say that the experience that is captured in the, in the work is something that cannot be understood by what you already know. And that's how I named it Ghachar Gochar. 
uh, and, and this as well, I'm sure this is the, the Sakinas kiss where this part comes, is uh, uh, the central metaphor of, of, the, of the novel. And uh, how it appears, uh, I'm sure if, uh, you know, once you read, you know what it is. And I really expect that the, it, it reveals the meanings in the minds of the readers slowly over a period of time. Yeah. There is Sakina, you must read. There is Sakina, yeah. Yes. yeah. So able to find she may not be visible. It tells you what's special about that, you know, because I, there's a deception to me, and the reference is there only once or twice. I think how many, I counted the research five or six times, perhaps. And yes, but the title is very telling. As we said, I don't want to reveal the secret to you because I want you to find yourself. She's very much there. Very much there. You need to find. And this is where the space in between would come into play. The deception and the truth. Raj, why is that number 20? Why should not be here? Well, uh, two things. One is unlike S Sakina, my patient is right there from the first page. Uh, so you will have no difficulty in finding him. It was not my working title. Uh, it was something that, m that my editor came up with, Mansi Subramaniam. And, and when she came up with the title, I just thought it was very fitting because in the times we live in, when everything is a marker of an identity. The patient in bed number 12, it is very difficult to take a stand on the patient in bed number 12. Are you pro the patient or are you anti the patient? Uh, uh, it is, you don't know. It is, it is just a patient in bed number 12. It is a vulnerable something where each one of us has been in that space. Um, and why the patient and, and why the number, that is the only thing that is autobiographical. I lost my f father in 2019 and his bed number was the same. So I thought that's the way to recall that number. That's the only reason uh, that the number is that. Uh, otherwise, uh, it, is not, it is not at all. Yeah. But perhaps that's why there's a great sense of reality. You know, tangibility about the hospital's feelings. There's one that the, the patient has passed away and you, the, the bill is there, the bill items are listed. And say, if this item was born one hour, that means that the time will start to catching up the body. And there's so much of reality uh, about the hospital environment and experience. I think it's all there. We can all experience. Uh, I also met a tragedy in 2020 during COVID. Uh, at time, perhaps, but uh, I, I, I very closely identified with the way he describes the hospital world. Anything, any thoughts on that? You know, I think each each one of us knows that the most vulnerable we are uh, when when a loved one falls ill, falls sick, and um, and it doesn't matter to us. You know, we. We hear so much these days about how polarized the world has become and how we live in our echo chambers and we don't listen to others we disagree with and how difficult it is to find a common ground. And that has become almost a refrain in every conversation. A loved one falls ill and that entire conversation is up in the air. The hospital lobby is the closest to a common ground that you can ever get. It doesn't matter who the doctor is. It doesn't matter, you know, you know and, when, and when you are at your weakest ever. So to me, that setting gives the space to the father to, to also liberate himself from his own demons. The fact that he knows his end is near the fact that he is in a hospital where there are other people on other beds next to him. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Absolutely right. Uh, one of the things that I want to share with you is a very complex and intricate time scheme of both the novels. The patient in bed number 12, there are 31 stories. There are three parts to it, part one, part two, part three. There are 31 stories in part one, each for one night. So the patient in bed number 12 is there for 31 days. 
and each night they are scoring. But these 31 days, that is 31 stories cover. Actually, cover the lives of many people and over multiple years. I would say, if I started counting the number of years which I cover, it would be at least 30 years by it. And same for Vivekis work. The action is over four days. The tangible narrative action is over four days. But within those four days, 40 years or something of that type could be covered if you see the past and the present. This constant shifting from the past to the present. One life connecting multiple lives, but I would call a very compact and complex type scheme, along with horizontality because so many lives exist simultaneously in both the novel. Would you like to comment on that? <coughs> You know, uh, yeah, but you know that is that is how you have read it, and I was not aware of that when I when I was writing it. The only thing that you know now that you tell now that you frame it in this manner um, is that for most of us living in the society in which we live, we all know how much so sort of how difficult it is to live solitary lives. Uh, Whatever we do, our paths intersect with a range of people the moment we step out of our homes. And inside the home as well, um, the people who come and work there. Uh, and in a way, it is very different from any other society. Uh, you know, and, and storytelling for me in, in this, it was that you need to flit through so many lives they all lived next door to each other, and they were all connected. Um, and that was what, what I thought is a part of the book. Huh? Yes, but you go back to Nisha's life in part two, from where you left, she left you, and then you come back to the present, and then the part three, the camera, is very, very complex. You get any thoughts on four years, and for four days, and 40 years? See, this timeline is a complex thing in, a, in, a, in fiction. Uh, and then, like all the writers, I look for something which is a point in time in the lives of these characters, as it happens in, in life, that there is always some point from where you can look at your past and present and possibly think of your future. And it could be some tragedy, it could be, it could be anything. But then there is, there is uh, as a writer, I look for these things, these points in the lives of these characters. And if there are five characters, if there are six characters, ten characters, there is always one looks for this point where the lives of these characters, their arc is somewhere it interferes and, and I look for that point. That point is these three days. Yeah, and and I, once you find this thing, then completely the, the entire their lives, their interactions, their relationships, and, and what they are, they start, uh, I mean, they start, you know, I start looking at them in a completely different light. But it is important to find that point. And uh, that is where I guess, uh, you know, a writer's, uh, writer is always looking for such uh, points and such, in, uh, uh, interactions between these characters. You know, one of the things that I found in both the texts, uh, both the works, rather, if you professor, uh, I use the word text for anything that comes to my name. Uh, yeah, both the works, there is a circular moment. We go all over, we, we go to so many people, so many ages, so many years, back and forth, <coughs> until we come back to where we begin. In your text, you begin with a knocking at the door. We add also to the knocking at the door in an impatient manner. So as we begin, that I in fact keep my child away, your child away. We end also with the past time in a manner of speaking. Uh, why this circular moment? Anything to make you like to take us? Knocking at the beginning, knocking at the end. Same impatience. Uh, is that is a trying to prove the point? Are you trying to send a message to the circular moment? Or do I see the not circular as the circular? No, I'm not particularly saying it is circular, but then it starts with a knock. Uh, the novel starts with a knock and also ends with a knock. And obviously, the two, uh, the context for both these knocks are different, and the circumstances are different, and the mindset of Venkat and how he responds to these knocks are different. Uh, 
Yeah. yeah but in what way? Uh, as the story progresses, they, that when the novel opens, they, the, he's, uh, he's curious about uh, who is in, and the consequences of that are of completely, completely different. And when it ends, he has not yet opened the door. It ends with a knock. Uh, again, somewhere there is a connect with the thinking. And another question, even if I Nisha to put it like meaning night, you don't qualify any other name. But Nisha meaning night. Um, of course, Nisha means night, no doubt. But why? Why this specific, such, such precise translation? No, I think the question is, is far sharper than any <laughs> yeah, then any of, m of my answers can be. Uh, but I'll try, you know, look, there is a fundamental contradiction in storytelling, uh, which we as a writer have to face, and we find, and, and we tackle that contradiction in our own ways. So one is the fact, and Susan Sontag has talked about that. It's, it's not very original, but the fact that one is the story is something that, you know, I'm going to tell you a story, which is the real story, which is what has happened, uh, which you don't know. And the second is, it is just a story. It's, it, it is fiction. It, didn't, it did not happen. Most of us like to read or like to watch films or read stories because it did not happen to us. Uh, and I think this contradiction between fiction and faction that is the subject, that sort of story being go a story going to the heart of the truth and a story going to the heart of the lie, that is the contradiction um, that we have to deal with. And in a way, I talk about fiction and section of spaces in between. How much liberty does fiction afford, which you cannot go in, say, journalistic, because you both of you have been journalists in the embarrassed. Vivek was the editor of Dishpada, and you have been a journalist for a long, long time. You have recognized, both of you recognize as journalists also. What is that the fiction affords you? That simple stage, that luxury, that liberty, which a journalistic mode of writing would not do that. And therefore, you find this a more apt. Uh, medium to talk about factions in fiction? Uh, <clears throat> I think it, it gives you a certain distance to look at your own experiences, uh, to, for example, you know, the reality, uh, so that you can really uh, unravel certain insights. And many people ask me when, when they read my books that, is it your experience? And I feel that question is uh, immaterial because if you write a novel with such intensity and knowing these characters in such details, at the end of it, I cannot say it is not my experience. I mean, it, it has to be my experience. I mean, it becomes my experience. So I think the fiction allows uh, this uh, as against any other form, and which is why I think uh, it is it is it can really. Uh, bring out such insights and, and at least attempt to unravel some truths. Thank you, Raj. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I completely agree with Vivek there. Uh, fiction gives, at least to me, it gives me the tool to deal with what's the bell curve, what's in the bell, because most of the time, every day of our waking life, we we are overwhelmed and we are hijacked by the outliers, by the extremes on either side. The bell curve is boring 
It is ridiculous. It is not something we talk about. That's where we pay our bills. That's where we, we open the door when, when the doorbell rings at home. That's where we pay our loans, our EMIs. We, we struggle with our fears and our hopes. And fiction gives us the tool to understand what that bell curve is in a better way than, yeah. Something I want to add to this. Uh, sometimes when these young writers uh, come to me with their work, and if I suggest to them look at other options, other possibilities of a work, then they say, sir, this is how it happened. And I, I really feel that unless a writer liberates herself from that reality, because what is, uh, you know, many times people rely on certain uh, incidents, certain experiences in their life, but fiction is different. You, one has to liberate uh, oneself from, from that, otherwise it cannot happen. So this thing that, this is how it happened, is the biggest hurdle in creating good fiction. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I could really go on and I have so much to talk about, but no, I would put it in a state of myself down for now. And we request the audience to ask questions from the writers of the two works that we are discussing, a great opportunity. We would like to accommodate as many questions as possible. So we take three or four questions together, and your time is uh, very limited. And then I will ask both Raj and Vivek to respond before I give back the two DB marks. Uh, please raise your hand and start speaking only when the mic comes to you, because it's been transmitted, recorded, etc. So please raise your hand and the mic speaking what it yeah. is. There is this lady who is there in the, in, yes, in the fifth, please. at the back. Yeah. Mic to her, please. Hi. Uh, my question is to uh, Mr. Shanbag. Uh, I'm sure you've been asked this many times. I've read both your works, Gachar Gachar and um, uh, Sakina's Kiss. Um, uh, wh why are your novels always open-ended? There are questions that are uh, un uh, left unanswered. Is it, uh, you, do you consciously, uh, you know, end it that way? Do you want people to, you know, want more? Or is it that you think those questions are not important enough to be answered? Thank you. So we will take all questions together. Now let me respond to oh, this. I think that's yeah. Okay. Uh, no, first of all, all my works are not like this. Uh, but the one that uh, you mentioned, the the two, I felt require that kind of an ending because see, it is not that uh, if there are three options, it's not that I can't choose one of them and and uh, close the uh, story or or in close in quotes, right? But we are used to writers giving solutions to us. And I really want a reader to participate in this and take responsibility for the ending. And you start thinking about three options and whichever way, whichever one you think is possible, there is something which, which you, you feel you are responsible for it. And that feeling is something that I have wanted to generate in both these things because the kind of themes that I have dealt with uh, in, in both these are very, uh, in a way, dark. And they reflect what is around us today. And I would really uh, want readers to take it upon themselves and not say that uh, this writer is saying this and this is fine, take it and, and you know, nice. The, and, and so I would, this is where, uh, this is why these works are like this. It's not that all my works have uh, open ending. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Next question, please. Uh, yes. Mike, please. Go. Good afternoon to all my dear panelists. My question is from uh, Raj, sir, that uh, as you said, we like to read or watch movies because it's not happening. But there are some fictions as well, like your own book, uh, the, A City and the Sea is an example that uh, it talks about fiction, but that fiction is somewhere happening so many times everywhere around us. So uh, how should we deal with this situation of dangling between fiction and faction and the real lives which we face with it? That, uh, that depends on you, sort of how you deal, uh, you know, what you choose, the fictions that you choose to deal with are very different from the fictions that the person sitting next to you will choose. Uh, 
uh, and and I think that is that is an individual choice. We all make. What about our lives? What about the facts of our lives? Do we deal with as facts? And what are the fictions we deal with? That's a very personal choice. Uh, sort of in a way, you know, hopes. Sort of hope is a fiction that we live with. Sort of hope is the fiction that we tell ourselves. Fear is a fiction that we live with. So, so what are the ones that we deal with? What are the ones that, that, that we need to tackle? As you said, we need to address. That is, that is a choice which each one of us makes. Thank you. We have three minutes left. One quick question. Uh, yes, uh, sir. My question is from Vivek, sir. So uh, you are actually a Kannada writer, and uh, you write in regional language. And we are seeing in India that uh, the readers in regional language are decreasing day by day. So apart from being a mother mother tongue, what inspires you to write in Kannada, or what? inspires you to write in regional language and what is uh, what will be your motivation or uh, for the future readers or uh, future writers to come in uh, in indian languages and my second question is that that you said that uh, in fiction you have to use a part of creativity so that it complete uh, so that it comes in a beautiful way uh, but how writer uh, uh, changes or modifies that particular real part of his life or the thing with with whom with which he is connecting in that yeah. way where it comes into a fiction okay, okay. Uh, see first of all i am a kannada writer i can write only in kannada there is a fiction writer uh, writing fiction requires a very deep engagement with with uh, a language any language and I have that engagement only with Canada. So I cannot write in any other language, uh, fiction, right? I have written non-fiction in English. That, that's, that's a completely different thing. But, and that relationship is so important because when you write, it's not that we write what we know. In the process of writing, some things come up which are unknown to us. And that is possible only if you have a deep relationship with a language. And for me, as a writer, that is with Canada, and that is uh, it, it is fine. I mean, there are so many great writers of the world which have who have not written in English. It's a very wrong thing for us to even say that uh, you know we have uh, uh, great works only in English. So today, the uh, literature in uh, written in English. Uh, I mean, you must really see what is uh, being written in in the rest of the world. So it is not see it's incidental in in which language a writer writes. It is absolutely, it's, it's just that if I was uh, born in uh, uh, Calcutta, maybe I would have written in, in Bangla. And so that is how it is. I think we are at time up. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you very much, both of you. And I am sure, as I said earlier, the two books under the special CV have served a lot of really English writing by Indian authors. And I'm sure the next decade we'll see many others following the examples that both of you have said. Thank you very much.